Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. You're very welcome to uh, QPS Talk Time. This is our first QPS Talk Time for uh, 2024, and uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all, uh, especially if you've not been with us. And I know we've had a great response to uh, today's um, uh, topic, and uh, I will be introducing our speakers shortly. Uh, apart from the chat, we can also uh, get you to uh, engage with us on 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 uh, Twitter on X, um, so please uh, follow our, our our Twitter handle there at QPS Talk Time, and uh, we'll be tweeting out some of the the highlights of today's session. Um, uh, you'll be able to watch back the video on uh, the um, on the YouTube channel uh, at National QPS, and again, there's there's lots of videos there from previous sessions that we've done, and uh, you'll be able to to see lots of. Uh, uh, previous talk time uh, videos there and some other resources and we're on LinkedIn now as well so if you want to follow us on on that so lots of uh, uh, social media opportunities uh, if you want to engage with us there um, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague uh, Dr Orla Healy uh, uh, for a few moments who's here today just to to launch the new QPS prospectus on uh, educational uh, offerings uh, so Orla uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to QPS talk time Thanks very much, John, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, as clinical director for quality and patient safety in the HSC, I'm delighted um, to share our annual prospectus of quality and patient safety education and learning programs. Many of you are familiar um, with the prospectus from previous years, because as you know, a key commitment of our patient safety strategy is to empower and engage staff and patients to improve patient safety to improve patient safety and this prospectus will not only support staff and patient partners to plan their learning and development for the year ahead, but it will also guide and support services in the new regional health areas to build their QPS um, capacity locally. Um, in the prospectus, you'll find a lot of information about programmes within our directorate. Um, so there's information and education and training material on reducing the common causes of harm on incident management, on open disclosure, on clinical audit, quality improvement, uh, human factors, and data for decision making. But this year, in addition, the prospectus includes related programs delivered by our colleagues across the system. Um, so we've included um, materials from AMRIC, from Governance and Risk, from the Spark Innovation Program, some lean safeguarding, Children's First, complaints, um, delivered change and many more. So I'd like to acknowledge the work of the QPS education team and Veronica and her colleagues who've pulled this very comprehensive document together and I hope you find it as useful a resource as, as we do within the team. You can find a copy of the prospectus on the directorate's website um, or you can contact the education team directly at qps.education at hse.ie. We're also um, this afternoon launching um, launching our latest podcast. Um, so the next episode of the Walk Talk Improvement podcast is part two of Bearing Witness Through Life and Death. It continues the conversation on the impact of patient partnership on the development of the HSE National Clinical Guidelines for Postmortem Examination Services. In this most recent episode, we're speaking with Mary Vasici and Christine Fenton. They both share their insight into their lives, their motivation and experience as patient partners and what we can learn from, from them on how to have meaningful engagement. You can listen to the podcast by scanning the QR code or clicking on the link in the chat box or wherever you get your podcast from. So thank you all very much. And I'm handing back to my colleagues now with apologies for the phone interruption in the middle of the intro. Thanks very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thanks, Orla. That's great. And uh, encourage people to check out those resources. Uh, so I'm just going to get on and, and introduce our, 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 our two uh, guests today. Uh, we're joined by Professor Eva Doherty, who may be known to many people. Uh, Eva is Director of Human Factors and Patient Safety at RCSI um, and has been a, a great colleague um, uh, for many, many years. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Eva today. And 
We're also welcoming uh, from Coventry in the UK, uh, Dr. Chris Turner, who's a consultant uh, in emergency medicine uh, with the University of Coventry and Warwickshire uh, Hospitals. Um, so uh, Chris uh, has uh, really pioneered uh, this area of civility uh, in the workplace and uh, is a founder of Civility Saves Lives. So Chris and Eva, it is great to welcome you to QPS Talk Time. So, so Chris, I'd like you maybe to help us set the scene a little bit and, and, and understand, you know, why this area is important. I, I remember when I learned about this first, I was I was surprised of the, you know, how much of an impact civility uh, has on, on how we work together as teams uh, and how we feel as, as people. Yeah, um, thanks, John. Yeah, well, so was I when I first learned about this stuff. In fact, when I first learned about this, this stuff. I thought this is interesting. I'll give a talk about it. Went away and did some reading. Thought it'd be one talk and I'd be going off and going and doing something else. And it seemed to resonate with people. So we started Civility Saves Lives, which is a grassroots organization dedicated to raising awareness of the impact of behavior on performance at individual team and organizational levels. We started that about seven, seven or eight years ago. And I never thought that this would end up being the sort of the big thing um, in my life alongside like family and work, but it is. And it's because it resonates with people. And I should probably start by saying what we're talking about when we talk about incivility. And we can think, if you think of threat as a wedge with a thin end and a really thick end, the thick end of the wedge of threat is me in front of you with my fist like that. That is clear and overt threat, and it triggers some very obvious physiological and psychological responses. At the very thin end of, the th of this wedge of threat is incivility. There are, these are behaviours that make us feel uncomfortable, but we don't necessarily feel that they're threatening. And we're thinking, was that meant to hurt me or not? And I'm not really sure, but we don't like it. We feel disrespected. And as it turns out, you can measure the impact that that has on people's ability to perform. You can measure the ability it has on their willingness to share information with other people. And information sharing is the key factor in teams in terms of how well they perform. And this has huge impacts. I mean, I just chuck a couple of statistics at you. In the moment when somebody treats this in an uncivil fashion, on average, we have about 61% reduction in our cognitive ability. But just witnessing somebody else being treated uncivilly has about a 20% reduction in our cognitive ability. But this bleeds into all sorts of other areas. And I'd like to share just very quickly for a minute or two um, something that's related to this. It's not exactly the same thing. But there's enough in there that I think it's worth talking about. And that is the impact of behavior and well-being at work. And I don't know about you guys, but when COVID came along, we got a lot of stuff chucked at us about well-being at work. And it was all aimed at us. And the responsibility was on my shoulders, what I can do for me. We got apps, Sleepio, Headspace. We got told to do mindfulness. We got told we should be making sure we're fit. We're doing all these things. And the idea was that well-being at work was personal. It's my responsibility. I have to look after me. And this guy called Tate Shanafelt, uh, and in fact, there's other newer data from other people as well, and Eva might well talk about this. But this guy called Tate Shanafelt in America who started looking at this. He looks at it in doctors, but I do not for one second think this is about doctors. I think this is all of us, particularly working in healthcare, but it may well be outside healthcare too. And it's not, personal resilience isn't 80%, it's not 70%, not even 50%. In fact, if you look at the Tate Shanafelt work, it looks like this Mercedes sign. It looks like personal resilience is one third of our well-being at work, but he says he regrets it. And actually it's really nearer to being 20%. That's what we can do for ourselves. Uh, and if you want a tiny bit of evidence on that, if you go into hospitals in America and you look and you see who are the most individually resilient um, healthcare professionals in the doctor groups, it's emergency medicine doctors. At an individual level, they are more resilient than other people. 
they score higher on the tests. If you also go into hospitals and you look at who are the most burnt out, which is the opposite of well-being at work in some ways, the single most burnt out specialty is emergency bed medicine. So these guys who have great personal resilience are simultaneously burnt out. And the reason for that is your personal resilience is not enough. It's only 20% of your well-being at work. So what are the other two things? The first one is something called efficiencies of practice. You can think of those as the pebbles in your shoes, the things that make work harder. And, you know, around the world, the number one thing is electronic patient records in healthcare. But if you don't have electronic patient records and you don't have a pen when you go to work, that creates an inefficiency of practice because if you don't have a pen, you can't do your job. Organisations tend to turn around and say, well, you should bring your own pen. That's your responsibility. Yeah, I get that. But I tell you what, if I don't have one, me scratching around at work for the next half hour trying to beg for a pen off people like a cigarette in jail that's not really helping so the these issues that our organizations can look at i mean this weird thing other things that are inefficiencies of practice and i'm going to talk about the toilet for a second or two which i know is an odd thing to talk about but we we have new bins at work and somehow or other uh, we managed to do, and this is nearly impossible, we managed to buy bins that don't work as bins. They work for about two days and then they break. And bins are pretty old technology at this point. And I have I have a favourite toilet at work. And don't tell me you don't have a favourite toilet. I know you do. I've got a favourite toilet at work and in my favourite toilet, and it's a really nice toilet, it got done up a few months ago and they got the sparkly stuff on it and it's got really bright lights and it's kind of sparkles when you go in there. In my favourite toilet at work, when you wash your hands, you wash your hands, you dry your hands, and then you stand on the bin, and the bin doesn't lift up. The bin doesn't lift up, and that means you've now got wet towels. So you walk out the bin, and sorry, you walk out the toilet, because you're not going to lift the bin up, and you go to find a bin that you can put it in, and there's not one, and there's not one, and there's not one, because all the other bins are broken as well. That's an inefficiency of practice, the pebbles in our shoes. But there's one other thing. And it's about 40% of our well-being at work. And it's this, our culture of wellness. You can think about this as esprit de corps, and it's who we are to each other, how we treat each other, what is normalized in our workplace. When we treat each other well, it's good for our well-being. And when we have good well-being at work, we're more engaged, we're more productive, we make less mistakes. When we have cultures where we allow people to not treat each other well, when we normalize that, when we don't share in the meaning of our work, then people simply have worse well-being. And one way of thinking about this is personal resilience is this. It's me standing in a field with my arms out like this, like a scarecrow in the middle of a field being battered by everything that work can chuck at me. And I can work on personal resilience. I can work on my core strength. I can work on my shoulders. I can make myself stronger. But there's a limit to that. And then on the other side, there's culture of wellness, which is me standing like this. But actually, on the end of this arm, I've got my hand on Eva's shoulder. Eva's standing with her arms out. She's got her hands on other people, on their shoulders. And we are forming a meshwork that is connected, that understands the meaning of what we're in work for, and understands the rules of how we engage with each other. And we have the opportunity to make work better for other people. And in fact, what I can do for other people is about 40%. It's about twice as much as I can do for myself. What you can do for me is more than what I can do for myself. And I just don't think we think about that enough. And I like sharing that because I think it's I think it's meaningful in terms of our workplaces. When things get tough, we tend to retreat into ourselves. But actually what we should be doing is trying to create environments where people are able to perform at their best and where we can support each other and where we get the chance to get through it together, not as individuals. And behavior matters. That's me. Great, Chris. Thank you. And you know, so it's about, I suppose, not doing certain behaviours such as been rude or, or, or incivil, but it's also about, you know, adopting other behaviours and, and uh, 
kind of pro-social behavior is things that, that help us to, to be together. Who gets to decide what rudeness is or what incivility is? The recipient. And that's a tough, tough answer. Because if I go into a conversation with somebody and I think I have been civil, my intent was pure, my intent was good, but the other person receives it in a negative way, that's what has an impact on their performance. And yeah. that might hack me off. But the truth is, how they feel matters. And it's, I can, I have some influence on this, of course. I, I can present myself in a way which hopefully makes things feel okay to them and that they know that I'm not on their case. But if they do feel I'm on their case, even if I don't intend it, that's what has an impact. That's what has that 61% reduction in their cognitive ability. And it's why in the background, two things come into this. The first is that our reputation really matters. Your theme tune matters. The music that plays in other people's heads when you walk in a room really matters. Because if they hear the theme tune to Jaws or the death march of Darth Vader when you walk in the room, I can guarantee you that they're interpreting you through the negative. They're looking for the threat. But if they hear That's a great question for our audience to ask themselves is, yeah. is, is what theme tune plays when, 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 when they come yeah. for all of us to ask? That's a, yeah, and, and actually, hey, if you want, what would you like people to hear? Hmm. And if you want them to hear that, how do you need to behave? Yeah. And, you know, there's lots of questions in that. Um, so, yeah, the, the, impact of, the impact of how other people perceive us is partly how we deliver ourselves, but partly our reputation. And, you know, we forget, and also as we get more senior, we forget that we carry a lot of threat into most conversations with people because we have power. Yeah. And and I meet lots of people who think that they're lovely, lovely senior leaders, but the people around them are terrified of them, but they don't know. Fantastic. Um, Eva, it's great to hear Chris, you know, who's coming to us from the UK talking about the uh, the incivility they have over there. Um, do, do you think, is this an Irish problem as well? I mean, you, you've worked in the health service for a while. Yeah, I mean, if I give you a warning shot, I I I have a suspicion it's worse over this side of the water. Um, it's certainly when you look at the the GMC, the General Medical Council, and the IMC data, certainly twice as many junior doctors report that they're being bullied than is the case in the UK. And when you look at um, the studies that have been done, so as we know, the HSE publishes data on this every year. Uh, we've done our own research as well. Um, and you ask people whether you know they've um, been they've experienced incivility. You find that about a fifth of them will say, you know, that it's happened to them in the last month. But the really interesting thing about that is, is if you if you actually then go and describe the actual behaviour. So you know, if you say you know, did somebody shout at you unreasonably, you know, in the last month, or did somebody do this or did somebody do that, then um, it shoots up, it doubles. So a lot of the time, you know, we don't, we accept bad behavior in the workplace, a lot of us, and we think, some of us think it's it's even normal. And we don't know, I love, I love Chris's phrase, he hasn't used it yet, but the one about how, you know, our bandwidth gets squeezed you know, when, when that is happening to us, and we literally, we can't think. So like, how are we supposed to look after patients when we can't think straight? Or when yeah. we have now been primed to be negative? You know, we cease being our lovely, helpful selves, and we are unhelpful and uncaring because we've just been exposed to this negativity. Um, there's data from Australia that says, you know, about three quarters of the time, um, with a, with any with a patient in hospital, there's conflict going on in the background. Um, that's you know, like, that's just you know, it's massive um, to think that that's going on all the time. Uh, and again, I I think I'm delighted we're having this webinar because I'm hoping it'll it'll trigger people to start talking with each other about you know about about how they behave with each other. Yeah, and we're not talking about kind of theoretical. Uh, models anymore. We're talking people have done 
experiments. We, we've got good data that shows that, that, like Chris's phrase, that their bandwidth or their, their ability to think and be helpful members of a team is diminished. Um, and we can observe this if, if, if it's done, isn't that right? Yes, we can. And that has been done um, by that, um, the researcher in Florida who then moved into healthcare, um, Eros, isn't that his name, Chris? Um, yeah, has conducted laboratory yeah. experiments demonstrating that, that. And Christine Parat in Harvard has done a huge amount in this territory as well. So, yeah, it's well established. We don't need to, um, you know, um, prove it again, I don't think. Um, that 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 this is is the case, and of course it makes sense. You know, we become cognitively overloaded when this is going on, and um, you know, and it stays on our mind. You know, sometimes you know for quite a while. Um, One of the nice ideas I, I came across, or nice phrases, that helps explain this to me at least, uh, from Jill Bolchi Taylor, a neuroscientist, said that you know we're we're not. We're not thinking creatures that feel. We're we're feeling creatures think. You know, and 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 uh, our default mechanisms, at many ways, are 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 our feelings. And and this this has a huge impact on our work. And maybe we just don't recognise this enough. Yeah, and I think too. I mean, I'll, I this is really the tip of the iceberg, but I'll just say it. You know, in terms of the whole issue of intent, that is incredibly complex because you know our our. Our intent is really like, you know, the to use the cliche of the iceberg, you know, we really only, and this is what psychoanalysis is all about, this is what psychotherapy about is about, is about reducing the level of the water down the iceberg so that you can become more and more aware of your emotional self and your intent. Because a lot of the times, you know, we could be quite nasty to somebody and think and think we're being fine because we don't, we're not aware of our true intentions, which are buried underneath the water, but they're like, that's another day's work. Um, but like intent is a, is a big issue. And Chris, what, how do we become more aware of, you know, again, our intent or even just our theme tunes, you know, what we do, our effect on the world. So the evidence on this is quite clear that if you start, if you become aware that this stuff matters, that people give a bit of headspace. And I think there's a real risk that we decide that people who are behaving negatively are deliberately behaving negative, be, negatively because they want to hurt the people around them. And that's, firstly, there's a lot of misunderstanding that goes on within that. But secondarily, there's a lot of people who behave certain ways in team settings because that was what leadership was to them when they were coming up through whatever system they're coming through, that they would have had bosses who role modeled a command and control dominant way of running a team. And the interesting thing about that is we, we know and we have known for a long time that command and control is a lousy way of dealing with a, a complicated or complex moving situation. Um, the, the single most important factor determined the quality of decisions that are made in team settings, and this doesn't matter if this is at a board level, McKinsey do work on this, or if we're talking back to risk and errors in their 2015 work on uh, neonatal resuscitation, that it doesn't matter if we're at the board level or if we are in the front line. The single most important factor to determine the quality of decisions that we make is information sharing. Do people choose to share information? And I always think of it like a tap. Are people going to turn on the, the flow of information or turn it off? And the, the most important factor determining whether or not we're going to turn on this flow of information is, do I feel valued and respected by the people around me? When we create environments, leave people feeling valued and respected, they turn on the flow of information. And we are going to get some information in that setting that we don't agree with and we don't like. And Eva was saying that the amount of conflict that goes on in, in healthcare settings. And I think it's worth just taking a second to say that we shouldn't always agree. If we're surrounded by people who think they know the answer and they all agree immediately on complicated and complex stuff, we've got the wrong people in the room or those people aren't able to speak. We should be accepting that in many situations there are lots of different perspectives. And if we want to make the best decision, we can only do that if other people share information with us. Because if I want to make a smart decision, if I don't know about something, 
if I don't know some factor that's involved, I simply cannot take it into account when, I, when I'm going to make the decision. And it's about creating environments where we understand we're going to dis disagree with each other, but we do that in a constructive way. And it becomes about what's our aim? Is our aim to do the right thing or is our aim to be right? Are we serving our ego or are we doing something that's bigger? And I think sometimes we mistake being right for doing the right thing and proving that we're right. We we mistake that for actually getting the best outcome for patients. And, and it's quite helpful to pull those two apart. Am I trying to be right here or am I trying to do the right thing? And that can be really difficult in the moment. But sometimes when you're in the car on the way home, you can kick yourself a few times. Yeah, yeah, it's a fascinating area. And and like you said, it's 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 inviting kind of different perspectives and encouraging that to be the norm. And I, I think that's something so important in safety is is you know the idea that that you know I uh, uh, as one practitioner can see everything, you know, um and that people won't tell me things because they think I can see everything, you know. Uh, it, it's so something about being vulnerable here is to, you know, my own limitations, isn't there? What, one of the issues here, sorry, Eva, I don't know if you want to come in there. I saw you look up. I was just going to allude to, I think what we're skirting around really is, is all the literature on psychological safety and Amy Edmondson's work is re really relevant here. And, you know, and I try to practice this myself and it, it, it can be challenging. Um, you know, it comes from the top down. It doesn't come from the bottom up. So this, this comes from, you know, we have to. We have to centre this on leaders. There's no, it, there's no point in running courses on this, you know, for the recipients, if you like. We gotta, we gotta focus on the leaders, because it is the leaders who are curious when something goes wrong, who have the, you know, the level of emotional intelligence that they can regulate themselves, that they don't lose the plot when, when there's a disaster, you know, and they are humble themselves. They don't put themselves out as all knowing, all capable you know, people who never make mistakes and know it all, that they're happy to, you know, show off their 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 struggles, but that they they have it they give it across a sense of mastery. Okay, I'm I'm struggling with this one, but I know where to go and I know what to do about it. Um they're the most that's the most effective role model. And that kind of psychological safety is so crucial, you know, to what we're talking about here, because we're never going to get a you know, a culture of wellness or a, a, a civil, civilized culture, if the leaders are losing the plot, you know, and being and, and losing their temper when things go wrong and chopping people's heads off. Uh, and, you know, we've a long way to go there, I would suggest. And by leaders, I think you're referring really to people who are, you know, in, in positions every day where they are leading teams or, or uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, make, make the things that should happen, happen. You know, it's, it's not, it's not necessarily the people right at the top of our organizations. It's everyday leaders, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, and I, you know, if you're a CNM three or maybe even a CNM two, oh, sorry, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a nurse. I'm not totally sure, but I just know like you've got people underneath you. You're their leader. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're leading, you know, if I don't know, whatever, like we're all leaders. We all have people who look to us, really. Most all of us do in various ways. Yeah. Um, can, can I just, possibly? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just, just going to come in there really quickly. There's a question just coming in in the chat box there, and it's sort of really, you know, pertinent to this piece of conversation in that it's very hard to tackle this if you witness it. So have we got tips on how can people actually intervene so that if I, if I am there, if I am the CNM3, if I am, you know, the grade five in the team, whatever it is, whatever my role is, or if it's just a colleague, what can I actually do in that circumstance if I witness it? I mean, I'll just come in there really quickly and then let then let Chris speak. But this is what we do in our human factors training um, in loads of different ways. So we try to skill people up um, with ways of managing. And um, there's lots of there are lots of different ways. Um, I would suggest to people if they're interested that they they just Google the four D's. Um, that's a good place to start Four four strategies, beginning with D. Um, and they can look them up. They're very handy. Um, but I, and also, I know that um, in the resources, there is a link to a talk I did for the open disclosure program on conflict and um, it's an hour long. So there's loads of 
uh, strategies in there um, that people can use as well. Uh, but there are things there are things to do. Time doesn't allow to go into them in detail, but there but there are things. But yeah, Google the four D's because actually I don't think I talk about that in the um, in the in the webinar actually. But that and other things. There's loads of skills you can use. It's all got to do with communication, and it's all got to do with emotional intelligence um, as well. Thanks for that. Thank you. Chris, have you any 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 tips on on how to if if, if you witness this how to how to address it? Okay, so I have a ton of thoughts on the stuff we've been talking about before, but let's talk about that for a second or two. Um, I think the first thing is that it is incredibly difficult to intervene sometimes. An awful lot of the work that's been on active bystander stuff is done on campus. And it's done about sexual assault. So active bystander work on sexual assault. Now, it's pretty clear a lot of the time that something looks like sexual assault. The problem with incivility, the problem with rudeness is it's not always clear what's going on. We don't know what the interaction between these people are. We don't. There's a bit of us always making a judgment. We think, do they deserve it? You know, that that that's. That's a whole conversation of its own somewhere else. When we're, when we're talking about does this person deserve to be talked to in that way, uh, I would argue not. But I know there's different people who think about it different ways. So it can be incredibly difficult to intervene in the moment. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. Sometimes it's not, because if someone's if someone's on the cusp of really losing it, say, and the most obvious this is lazy, but the most obvious thing is a is a surgeon and theatre who's on the cusp of losing it, if you poke them a bit more, they might completely lose it. Well, they have to be able to perform. Somebody might die if they can't perform. So we have to create, in that setting, we have to create something that lets them pull it back a little bit. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to address it. We do. It's maybe just not there and then. And um, thinking about the conversations and how we have the conversations, my, my thoughts on it have evolved a lot over the years. And this is this is the meta part of having a conversation with somebody who we believe has behaved in a way that has undermined a culture of safety, excellence or learning. And the meta conversation goes like this for me. Three rules. The first one is I am going to have a conversation with uh, Eva. I'll use you because you're on the screen. I'm going to have a convers conversation with Eva about something that happened. And I am going to have that with compassion. I am going to actively care about Eva in that conversation because we know that people who hurt, who hurt others are often hurting themselves. Not always, but often. So first thing is I'm going to have it with compassion. It's counterintuitive. It's hard to do, but we get better at it when we practice it more. The second bit is I'm going to have a conversation with Eva without judgment. I am not going to tell her she's bad. I'm not going to tell her she's unprofessional because the second she tells someone that they're unprofessional, you, you're not having a conversation anymore because they are just pushing back on that button. They're going, no, I am not unprofessional and they deserved it for this, this, this. So I'm not going to have any judgment. And the third thing is I am going to give Eva a professional gift. And the professional gift is this, the knowledge of how somebody else experienced them. And that's it. I'm not going to assign intent to what Eva did. I am going to try to support her in it and I'm not going to judge her. And for me, that reframing of these conversations, and I also reframe what I call them in my head, they are no longer difficult conversations. They have become essential conversations. I'm going to have an essential conversation with somebody. I'm going to do as little damage to them as possible. I'm not going to judge them. And I'm going to give them a professional gift. And, and that's the framing that I use. One of the things that's really difficult about this stuff is that the older we get and the more senior we get, actually these conversations get a wee bit easier. They're not easy, but they get a wee bit easier. And sometimes we think, well, everybody should be able to do this. And everybody wants to be able to do it, but it's incredibly difficult, particularly if you're pushing this conversation up a hierarchy. It's nearly impossible in some settings. So it really is something we've got, we've got to do together, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's very hard to do this on your own. Yeah. I mean, that's all. So I think that approach is fantastic. And, you know, th that's from Vanderbilt University, isn't it, Chris? It's the cup of coffee conversation. And, you know, the evidence is super, you know, with 70 to 80 percent of the time, the problem will go away because the person really didn't have insight into how they were coming across. 
and I've just sent in, sorry, Chris, for sending you one more uh, resource, but I've just sent in an app which comes from, it's, it does come from doctors, but it applies to everybody. It comes from the Royal um, Australasian um, College of Surgeons and it's called Speak Up. So if you put in R-A-C-S, Speak Up, it'll pop up in your app store and it is brilliant for cup of coffee conversations because it's got loads of tips and what to expect. And of course, the point is, don't expect the person to thank you and say, oh my goodness, thank you so much. You're such a wonderful person. I didn't know this. That probably won't happen. So if you don't have that expectation and then, you know, it isn't a happy ending. Well, you kind of knew that from the start, but the evidence is it can really make a big difference. The other thing I'm going to put a plug in for is our own very unique HSE National Healthcare Communication Programme, which is an absolutely super, super set of programmes. I don't say so myself because I helped um, them. And there's the resource coming up there and they have a module, a whole module on this, module four. Um, so, you know, everybody start asking for that because um, that's just a super, super module. And you can go on the website and have a look at uh, all the resources there. Um, but that's all about getting on together and working in teams and resolving and I think, conflict. I, I, I think things that help us with these great resources, you know, and the skills of communication are, and I think yourself and Chris have alluded to this already, you know, the intent of of compassion or kindness. And and I, I know, Chris, this is something uh, you feel strongly about as well, is, is the, the role and the importance of kindness in healthcare. And we, we asked it in our question at the beginning. Um, but again, you know, maybe there's there's the idea that kindness is just too soft and 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 mushy, you know. But actually, kindness and compassion, when 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 practiced properly, are hard, but they they really do, I think, share the intent, which is that we you know we want to help, we want to share with people things that will help them and 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 ultimately help us all. Eva, shall I? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think the the only problem there is is that intent is a complex thing, and and mm -hmm. I have my own little theory. Um, you know that in fact, when our sort of conscious intent is, you know, that we are so concerned, we so want to be the best that we can be, we have to be really careful because we can run the risk of coming across as quite punitive, you know, towards mm -hmm. others without meaning to. Uh, sure. because of our anxiety and our perfectionism. So, and, you know, healthcare is full of them. And so, you know, like, it's not just simple to be able to say, oh, well, I'm going to be the nice person I can be, you know, um, this is, this is tricky stuff. And, mm. the, and, you know, signs of it, you know, this is why it's such a problem, I think, because if it was all easy, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, you know, so like this is not this is not simple. And just to answer your question, Anne, yes, the four D's is the bystander intervention. Four D's I'm talking about. You you found them. But I do think I do think kindness is still a helpful a helpful you know paradigm for us to to work through even collectively. You know, and I appreciate that the, the the trickiness of it, Chris. So, okay, the longer I've been looking at this, and this is going to sound a little bit weird, but I don't think. That in many situations, the solution to incivility is civility. I think civility is a good place to start from, but I think that the solution to incivility is often kindness. And by kindness, I mean having the conversation without assuming malintent on the other person's part. And I think it's important to pull apart nice and kindness for a set for a second here. Um, if I work with a colleague who is smelly, and we've all worked with a colleague who is smelly, some of us may have been the smelly ones. But if I work with a colleague who is smelly, it's not nice to tell them that their personal hygiene could be better. But it is kind, and we can do it kindly. We can do it unkindly as well, but telling them is kind, clear is kind, and kind is clear. And it's important that people get feedback if they're to have any hope of changing course. If nobody tells me that I'm smelly, I'm not going to be able to change course. If nobody tells me that I come over like some 
angry Scotsman who's ready to stab you any second, how am I going to know to change? Because that's not what I see in the mirror. I see something different in the mirror. I see a guy who's full of love and happiness. So was, this was an experience of mine in going to live in England, coming from Scotland and going to live in England. And I've lived in England for about 20 years now. That I discovered that sometimes I would say something and genuinely it would be like full of love in my heart and people would be scared of me. I'm thinking, what on earth is that all about? But just when I get a bit excited and uh, maybe speak a wee bit faster, roll my R's a little bit more, suddenly people have versions of, I don't know, Grinsman Willie from The Simpsons with a with a knife. Um, I wonder if I might touch on, on a couple of things quickly whilst I have the floor, John. Is that all right? Um, yeah, please. Okay, so here here's the thing about psychological safety. And... Uh, Victoria Brazo, who's a professor at Bond University in the Gold Coast, said something and it absolutely resonated with me. And I'd never thought about it this way. She said, you can't create psychological safety. You can only co-create it. I can't tell you that I've created psychological safety for you. The only way we get there is when we get into a conversation to understand what it takes to have psychological safety so that you feel able to speak. And the other thing I, I just want to touch on was, was about permissions and how permissions can help people to feel able to talk. There's different sorts of permissions at different times, but one of them is, you know, if we want to have a, if we're going to have a difficult conversation with somebody, one of those essential conversations, a really helpful question at the beginning is, is it okay if we have a chat? Because sometimes you go to speak to people and they're utterly overwhelmed. And the, you know what? Right now is not the right time to go and have a chat. Last time I said to a colleague, is it okay if we had a chat? Her response was, yes, know that I'm going to be sad when you tell me what you're about to tell me, but I want to hear. Which was wildly insightful and exactly what happened. But the other bit about this is about sharing information. And if we want people to share information with us and we're in senior positions, we can give them permission to speak and giving people permission to speak is really weird. I mean, it's really weird the impact it has. Turns out that as human beings, if we invite other people to tell us what they think we're doing wrong, we're quite good at listening to what, what they tell us. But if people just tell us what they think we're doing wrong without us inviting them, we are not very good at hearing that. And when we're in positions of seniority, we can invite people to talk because people won't share things with us. And I'll give you a concrete example of non-sharing. And it comes from deep in my past. And I'm going to talk about somebody that I really like and I respect. And this this is a matter of public record, so I'm, I'm not slandering the guy here, okay? Um, there's a guy called Martin Yates. Martin Yates was the chief exec of Midstaffs when Midstaffs, Midstaffs won these NHS disasters. And Martin's a really good guy, genuinely good guy. He is, however, quite quick to anger. And sometimes he'd be quick to anger. And what happened when he was quick to anger is that people stopped taking him information. And that's what happens to all of us when we're quick to anger. Then when the privilege of leadership allows us to be quick to anger, people stop bringing us stuff because they don't like the response. And then we get a start of information and how can we make the best decision? So inviting people to tell us stuff, but hoping that they don't then weaponize that invitation is part of getting more information for all of us. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I, I love, you know, th these little things that we can do and I think trying to build them into our everyday whether it's a huddle or a handover you know e even for 30 seconds to invite you know feedback or or, or you know actively kind of you know ask people to to give you the the, the, the difference uh, of perspectives you know and, and you know building up those practices and and, and the, the power of the invitation I think is really important yeah. thanks Chris Eva have you any thoughts on that I can see Juanita is trying to get in there. Just, yeah, it's, it's just interesting. We've done some work on engagement skills with staff on quality and patient safety. And what we found is that sometimes you need to ask them more than once. So you can give the invite, but sometimes we're 
biased in terms of our experience of a person or we have a bias in terms of a previous manager or a leader and we have an expectation that this is what they want to hear or this is how I have to give them the information. So sometimes we need to go back to someone and say, no, 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 I really want to hear what you have to say. Um, and if you're not getting an actual engagement with them, then you might need to go back and say, listen, no, I'm really serious. I do. I do want to hear it. Yeah. And, and just speaking on the things that, you know, we can do. One of the things I think it might be really helpful to mention it was was the maternity services um, work where they started the conversations about incivility and what it looked like. If you'd be happy to talk about that, Chris, because I do think for people, sometimes it isn't tackling it after it's happened, but it's how can we actually improve civility in the workplace as it stands at the moment? Yeah. OK, so super Thanks. quickly, this is work by Anna Baverstock in Somerset. She's a community paediatrician. She did this work with some midwives um, and Anna and these guys went into maternity units. And they started off just by talking about the impact of behavior on performance, because the, the problem with knowing that behavior matters is once you know, you have the curse of knowledge and it's hard to imagine that other people wouldn't know that. But when they went into the maternity units, only 60% of people believed that behaviour had a material impact on performance of those teams. And they spent a year doing lots of little sessions. And over the course of the year, they got the percentage of people who believed that behaviour mattered from 60% to 100%. They simultaneously measured the percentage of people that had seen incivility within the units within the preceding two to four weeks. And when they started off, it was just over 70% of people thought so that they'd seen incivility in the preceding two to four weeks. And when they finished, actually when they finished, I thought that number would have gone up because I thought you'd have had this availability bias, you now know about it. But actually it was about 50%. And what that says to me is just starting the conversation lets quite a lot of people who potentially are, are better at self-regulating and possibly more emotionally intelligent, it allows them to go, okay, I'm really hacked off. I could behave this way just now, but that might have an impact on the guys around me. And just to reel it back in a little bit. So just the act of talking about this, understanding that behavior matters in a measurable way is enough for a lot of us to choose to change our course. Yeah, one of the most effective programs out there in the world that have really good data is a program called Crew. Um, developed by a guy called Michael Leiter and Christina Maslach stands for civility, respect and engagement in the workplace. And long story short, it's essentially, it's like doing family therapy with a team. It's like sitting down with them all and getting everybody to say, you know, what they want to achieve, what's important, how are they going to make it happen? What are all their little grievances? pebbles in the shoes, all of that, or everything that's being said here and trying to work towards, you know, common goals and being kind to each other. It's very effective. Needs to be facilitated by someone very skillful, I will say, um, yeah. you know, not for the faint hearted sometimes, um, but very effective. It's called Crew. I think he has a more recent version he came out with more recently, but it's the same idea. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. A lot of our workplaces take on the psychodynamics of what's going on around us. So, so there's something about that being able to sit down and have those conversations. Um, there's lots of questions coming in, and we've touched on some of them through the general conversation. Um, one person had asked us about, you know, is there a specific leadership style that is good in healthcare? And and control and command, I think, since COVID has been more prevalent than I think I've ever seen it. And I've worked in healthcare for 20 years. So, so is there is there a leadership style that people should be aspiring to? So Michael West would be completely clear about this. So Michael West, Professor of Leadership, King's Fund and Lancaster University, looks at metadata across the whole of the NHS in England, um, looks at behaviours and correlates them with performance. And he would say it is absolutely clear that the best form of leadership is compassionate leadership and that in complicated and complex situations, probably the worst form of leadership is command and control because you people who are at the top in command and control often end up starving themselves of information. Um, so that's what Michael West would say about that. And I, and I very much would lean into to his work. If anyone's interested, you've, if you look up Michael West leadership on YouTube, you'll find a bunch of stuff. Watch him talk for an hour. 
because he expands upon ideas much better in an hour than just the little tiny wee segments. Thanks for that. Um, and, and just there is just a question that's come in here in terms of the, the difference between civility and bullying and obviously the specific differences. And if somebody is experiencing bullying, there is a dignity at work policy for the HSE that's helpful. The civility stuff is is very very simple day to day behaviors that we all experience. So so it's 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 important to differentiate between the two of them. I pass back over to you, John. Because yeah, I was just going to come in there really quickly. I mean, I think if you if you're trying to figure out which is what, and I have to say there is a lot of confusion about that. I think if 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 you ask yourself the question, is the person I'm having these problems with, do they have power over me for some reason? It could be their status, it could be their gender, it could be, you know, their race, it could be, it could be anything, their qualification, whatever. Do they have some kind of power over me and are they not, are they abusing that essentially because they can? Um, then it's more likely to be bullying or is it, or is it more about kind of conflict between equals? Um, you know, that's a different thing. And there's a, to I'm going to say like some of the strategies overlap, but Really, if if it's bullying, the advice is, you know, you got to tell in some way, you know, you got to, you got to, maybe if you even just tell your partner or your best friend or your colleague or whatever, it's a series of escalated telling. And I know telling tales in Ireland, I'm sure in lots of countries, was not, is not, you know, uh, esteemed, but we got to tell and ultimately, you know, people can have access to converse, confidential conversations with somebody in their HR. And I've heard some really good stories about that before they actually have to go to the very end stage, which is make a formal complaint. Like that's the kind of end of the line. But I think you got to tell first and, 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 and do that and keep a journal of what's going on because it's amazing the way you forget who said what to who and, you know, um, oh but it's a, it's a, it's a different story than conflict between the equals yeah well yeah. folks we're getting to the end and i knew this was going to happen you know <laughs> that, that, that we, we we would have so much to keep going um I, i've learned so much um i've learned so much today um uh, from both of you but but I, I want to thank you both for what i've learned from you over the years and and uh, uh you know uh, it's been a real privilege to uh to 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 work with you both and and uh, uh, Eva, I know that will be ongoing. Chris, thank you so much for sure. everything you know you've done today. Thanks, I think the Civility Saves Lives movement is wonderful, and um, and just again, people can check out your website, and and it's a lovely website, loads of great resources. And just the other thing to mention is is you've had this great relationship with uh, 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 the uh, the folks in Learning from Excellence who we've had on the the, the webinar before, and. Uh, and just to give a plug, you may want to do it yourself, just to the Being Better Together podcast. I, I really enjoyed the first series, and I'm looking forward to your second series, which is coming out soon. Yeah, it's coming out soon. Isn't it? And it's usual, me and Adrian being a pair of idiots with each other, trying to understand very clever people telling us about stuff. Which I rather That's enjoy. great. Yeah, no, it's super, super well done. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for all you do. And Eva, we must check out, you have a podcast as well, isn't that right? Yes, we have um, a new podcast launched in October last year. And if you put it in, go into wherever you get your podcast and put in um, or CSI safe and sound. And we've made one with Chris. So if you want to hear Chris talking some more, um, he's there. And we've lots of others there as well. And we have a new one coming out tomorrow with the psychologist Ian Robertson, who some of you will know. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so we've got lots more exciting ones planned. Great. Well, look, thank you for being with us today. I want to thank our audience. I'm sorry we didn't get around to all your questions and comments. I just want to pick up on one there from Damien Nee uh, in, in St. James's. Uh, and we'll all agree, you know, I think civility is certainly made easier and better with a little uh, dash of humour, good humour, the right humour, um, but, but it certainly helps. And I think... Um, I want to thank everybody for being such great participants today. So uh, thank you all. Thanks for the invitation. It was great talking with you all. Yeah, Pleasure. it was a lovely way to spend some time. Thank you guys. Total privilege. So.
we just have some slides just to tell you uh, uh, about what's coming up. So again, follow us there on, on, on social media. And you, if you didn't get to watch the whole thing today, or you want to tell your friends about it, uh, you can watch it back on the YouTube channel. It'll be up there later on in the week. So uh, there are some resources Orla mentioned earlier, the prospects and uh, the, uh, the walk and talk improvement. Uh, there's some other um, resources there if you're interested, the, the, the new collaborative handbook for people who are interested in running uh, improvement collaboratives, uh, the patient safety matters, um, and there's a third edition of that out. And again, we encourage people to join the Q community uh, and uh, you can connect with people uh, uh, right across Ireland and Northern Ireland and uh, the rest of the UK, uh, uh, an improvement uh, community based around sharing people you know, have a need in patient safety and quality improvement. Human Factors program there uh, in the HSE, um, and there's some uh, uh, information on that. You can uh, check that out on the website. And uh, just finally, thank you for joining us today. Do give us your feedback. Um, uh, you'll get a, a, an email if you registered with us today. Uh, if you didn't, you can uh, you can uh, scan the QR code, join our mailing list, and give us some feedback that way. So I'd like to thank all the folks in the background, Wojita and Chris and Shima, and all the people who help us make this happen. And thank you to Eva and Chris uh, for joining us. And we hope you'll see us uh, for our next QPS Talk Time, uh, which will be on shortly.